We are back with episode 2 of our story analysis of Assassin's Creed Mirage and today we'll be focusing on the second and final part of the ending of the game, so spoiler alert here as we will dive as deep as possible into all the revelations and details that you might have missed. In the video, we are going to follow Basim as he opens the final door of the Isu vault located beneath Alamuth and we'll discuss the revelations about Nihal, about Loki's ancient memory, the nature of the Isu vault itself, that is an Isu prison, and why it stores so many memory seals. We're going to discuss who Loki's Isu jailer might be, who or what the genie actually represents, and then we're going to discuss Basim's final decision and the epilogue of the game with its ties to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. There is so much we have to to talk about, so let's jump in and dive deep into the ending of Assassin's Creed Mirage. So we pick up where we left off, with Basim arriving in front of the final door of the Isu vault located underneath Alamuth, an Isu vault that, remember, could be accessed by touching a tangible illusion of a wall, a building where, according to Nihal, people were brought in for negative purposes during the Isu era, that housed multiple memory disks or memory seals that were devices aimed at storing recordings of specific past memories of the Isu, and a building that also had multiple final doors in its main room room, not just the one that is calling to Basim. And here, in front of the door, Nihal starts breathing heavily and feeling pain. She keeps saying no, and again, remember these are the memories, the feelings of Loki nested inside of Basim reacting to what lies beyond the door. Memories of pain and suffering, as we'll see. At last, Basim opens the final door and sees a huge machine with a casket-like container at its bottom and a pillar in front of it. Basim says he knows this specific place, again this is because of Loki's memories nested within him, and now Nihal has disappeared. Not because he's now alone, but more because now Loki's memories are triggering a different vision to him. He hears somebody thumping from inside the casket, he gets closer, he forces it open, and inside of it he is shocked to see Nihal, and that is where he realizes where each player and viewer can see that Nihal never existed, that Nihal is the personification of Loki's memories and personality inside of Basim's head. What we saw in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, only in the memory corridor, only in Eivor's mind as the old, old father representing the memories and personality of the Isu Odin trying to influence Eivor, here in Mirage we are seeing in a different way, as an actual imaginary character that our protagonist Basim is seeing and has seen in the real world for as long as he can remember. At this point it should be very clear why the game is called Assassin's Creed Mirage. So if that wasn't any clearer, every time Nihal appeared in the game, every time she tried to steer Basim into a specific direction, every time she said she would have been always with him, those were the memories of the Isu Loki kicking in that Basim's mind was able to process as an imaginary character. And here finally he realizes too. But why does he realize it now? Why here? The answer lies in the next scene, where we see Nihal screaming, enough, let me out of here, while still being in the coughing like container with a red light illuminating the chamber on and off continuously. The same red light that illuminated for a moment the memory corridor when the genie appeared early on, as we mentioned in our previous video. And right after that, Nihal disappears and reappears on Basim's side with the memory disc, supposedly the same memory disc that Basim touched at the beginning of the game, or another one altogether, it's not really clear, after that Roshan scene at the start of the game, and this time, the disc shows a different scene from the Isu era, one that explains it all. And one where the two characters speak in the Isu language, but fret not, cause we have already translated it in a dedicated video. So here, we see what the game calls a prisoner being closed, locked in the casket-like chamber, he's saying, enough, let me out of here, he's imploring to be taken out of there, and a guard, his jailer, silences him. 
Something happens within the chamber, showing the prisoner bit by bit as if the chamber was filled with something or whether a protection was being lowered, which allows the guard to take the prisoner out of this tight and oppressing chamber, but only to exert even more brutality on him. He throws him on the ground and the prisoner seems defenseless, as if being kept in the chamber also had weakened him. The jailer slaps him as he's still reeling from the earlier pain, causing him to suffer even more. He kicks him on the ground and finally threatens him with a dagger that is very similar to the one that can be found in the Isu mini vault located under the oasis in the wilderness. All of this while Basim is watching, worried for the prisoner and very, very angry at the jailer and finally... Finally, as the jailer threatens the prisoner to kill him right there and then, that's where we find out that in Basim's mind, the genie is derived from that jailer, or more specifically from his feeling of fear that comes from this situation, and he himself being terrorized by the genie in his own mind is derived directly from the prisoner. Everything here comes together. Nihal, the genie, the terror, everything comes from this scene, which is a memory experienced by the Isu Loki, who here is the prisoner. We can get that almost explicitly from the scene we saw earlier, where Nihal, who remember is the personification of Loki's memories, was held within the casket-like chamber and was screaming the same sentence that the prisoner is seen screaming within the hologram. And if you needed even more proof, if you listen closely, the voice of the prisoner both in the first hologram scene and especially here is that of Lee Majdub, Basim's voice actor. So yes, that is Loki and this terrorizing experience was ingrained in his memory so much that when his memories got transferred into Basim as part of the workings of the Seven Methods of Salvation, this memory was so powerful that it affected Basim from the beginning of his life, he always had these visions in his dreams, but they were filtered through his own perception, much as Eivor filtered Odin's memories through her knowledge of the Norse mythology. So Basim always saw Loki from that memory as himself himself and the jailer, or rather the trauma that Loki went through in front of him, as a genie, a famous creature from the Islamic and pre-Islamic folklore. So who is the jailer then? Well, there are three options in my mind to answer this question based on what we have, and in a moment I will discuss all three of them, starting from the one I like the most, and that I find to be the more fitting to what we're seeing here, to the ones I believe are more likely to be presented here by the narrative team as the canon version of this story and of this Jader character. So let's start from the option I believe would be the most fitting here. If you remember a little bit of the extended lore of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, or if you have followed our analysis in the last few years, you might already know who I'm gunning for, but just in case let's have a look at all the clues starting from what this place, this Isu location really is. At this point I think it's pretty clear that this is a prison. The Isu vault beneath Alamut was a prison, which is quite poetic as our sources put it. One of the most important fortresses of the Hidden Ones, the bastions of freedom, literally built over an ancient prison. And it wasn't just a prison for Loki. As we said earlier, Nihal, or rather Loki, knew that also other people were taken here and for bad reasons. They were being brought here to be imprisoned in these machines where they were weakened and couldn't even move, maybe even breathe properly. And we saw multiple doors, meaning likely multiple machines for multiple prisoners. But this prison also housed several memory seals or memory discs, so what was their purpose then? It's not clear for sure, but judging from the two scenes we have seen, it seems like these discs recorded what happened within the prison, like some sort of futuristic CCTV tapes of sorts. It's just a hypothesis though, the game doesn't really say what memories and stories are stored within the discs, but I think this might be reasonable enough. So it is a prison, and a prison with an entrance which is masked by a tangible illusion of a rock facade featuring a symbol that if touched can lead to the actual entrance of an Isu vault. All that sounds very familiar as only one character had other, similar prisons being built to hold his prisoners, and that character, my favorite option for Loki's jailer in this scene, is indeed Odin, and in my opinion there are several clues actually pointing to this. 
First of all, like we hinted at earlier and in our previous video, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, in the Tombs of the Fallen activity, we already saw some Isu prisons created and managed by the Isu Odin that could be opened by removing the tangible illusion after touching the Odin rune placed over them, and even in those prisons, Odin had left other Isu to die. Second, there is a tiny physical trait to the Jader here, this sort of tiny beard or goatee, which might be a little element, a little nod to make him a little bit more recognizable. But most important here, there was already, within the established lore, one time where Loki had been in prison, and in that occasion he had been imprisoned by Odin, and at that time the story was told in the most unexpected of places, the Dawn of Ragnar DLC of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Yeah, didn't expect my mind to wander there again either, but here we are. I'll try and be brief though. In the events of Dawn of Ragnarok, Odin's son Baldur was captured by an Isu group or caste presumably originated in modern North Africa, led by the Isu Surtur, thanks to Loki's deceiving behavior, and while Odin didn't have proof that Loki had indeed been involved in Baldur's capture, he decided to still imprison him, put him in fetters as he said, chained as he had chained his son Fenrir. So my idea is that the imprisonment and torture scene from Mirage is set more or less around this time, cause according to Donna Ragnarok again, at some point Loki was able to escape his prison, and more specifically, the quote unquote cell in which you left him to rot, and after that, Loki went on to free his children, gather an army and march on Asgard etc, but what matters to us here, if all of this is connected, which is a big if, is that in the first theory as to who the Jader might be, Odin put Loki in a prison, this prison we have seen in Mirage, he put him there on supposed allegations, those were true but he didn't know, he tried as much as he could to torture him to admit his involvement into the kidnapping of Baldur, and when he didn't get the answer he wanted, he left Loki to rot in that prison, in that casket-like chamber where he screamed to be let out of. He left him there for who knows how much time, it could have been days, months or years, until somehow Loki was able to free himself and to do his best to release his anger and wrath with the attack on Asgard and his plan to use the seventh method in order to pass his memories on and somehow survive the Toba catastrophe. But that pain, that trauma, that fear, all of that stayed with him, and those were passed on to Basim too, which led him to interpret them as the genie who, in my favorite of these three interpretations I've thought of, represents both Odin as his jailer, and kudos to Andy Reloads for theorizing this so much ahead of time, but also the fear of Odin as his jailer, the fear of that very moment. But like I said, this is just my favorite interpretation of this, because it would add to the Odin and Loki duality and clash through time, but it might not necessarily be the most correct and canon one. In fact, many other fans have pointed out that while the owner of the prison and the mastermind behind this torture chamber might still be, or directly is, Odin, the jailer here might be somebody else entirely. After all, he is not missing an eye, and instead he is wielding a very peculiar dagger which has the exact same shape as the Samsama, the dagger that can be found in the mini Isu vault located underneath an oasis within the game, where players can also find the tomb of an Isu called Milad and obtain their Isu outfit. The game doesn't really provide any details about who Milad is, he just seems to be a character that is introduced here to provide an outfit and two weapons for the player, but the dagger's shape is indeed the same exact used by the hologram, so the second hypothesis is that while the owner of the prison, while the brains might have been Odin, the jailer, who is indeed just called guard here, the brawn if you will, could just be random new guy Milad here, who was in charge of the actual torturing of Loki, or maybe, third option here, the guard could be a no name nobody too, and the focus here wouldn't really be on who the jailer is, but rather what Loki is feeling, and by proxy, what Basim is feeling, which might be a more focused approach that the writers of the game might have taken here. But if this were the case, like I said, it wouldn't be my favorite option, as it would remove a very strong, very personal drive that the Odin vs Loki personal history would have added to this scene, especially after the whole story that was told in Valhalla. 
In general, I'd prefer the Jailer to be Odin, have a visceral connection to his prisoner Loki, rather than have him be newly introduced and possibly never spoken again Milad or a nameless guard altogether, which would reduce the impact on the overall narrative even though it would focus more on Loki's and Basim's feelings throughout the scene. So finally, we can get back to Mirage's ending. Through the hologram, Basim himself realizes where the genie in his memories comes from and this prompts a new vision, but one where Basim is now in control, where Basim knows what's happening. And now it is he who wants this confrontation with the genie, again with the red lights illuminating Basim and the background and I guess there was some kind of red light illumination in that prison chamber. Anyway, Basim starts going through the vision, dressed as young street thief Basim. It's a similar ground to that of the loading screen slash memory corridor slash grey, and I guess, like the genie, all of these figures we are seeing here and that can be seen in the loading screen as well, are faint shapes of Isu from Loki's memories. In this sequence, Basim himself realizes that the genie and the jailer from the holograms are one and the same. He finally realizes that what he's seen all this time, everything he processed as the genie hunting him, were memories from an ancient past. They are his, but from millennia earlier. He even says that the genie is the source of all that ails him. His quote unquote tormentor, which isn't a random word and seems to be another hint towards the jailer possibly being Odin or somebody working for him. In fact, in the Animus Anomalies in Valhalla, Loki called Odin Fenrir's tormentor and then our tormentor when talking about himself and Alethea. In this vision, in this grey slash memory corridor environment, Basim goes through several memories of his own story and more specifically those that quote unquote stir his soul. The kids that were killed in Anbar, the members of the order, it's in these moments, in the moments of adversity and at add in violent moments too like the various assassinations that the genie appeared. It's those violent moments that brought back the trauma nested inside his ancient memories cause during his time in Alamod he never saw the genie, meaning the memories of Loki's imprisonment were never triggered in that time and if you think about it, the same also applied to Nihal. At this point though, his inner struggle is about to reach its culmination. He finally feels that who he once was, that is Loki, wanted retribution. He wanted revenge for all the pain caused by Odin in general and the Jailer specifically, but he instead, Basim, also wants peace, to move on from the pain he has personally experienced. Within his mind, he sees a depiction of the cell where Loki was being held, he even calls it my cell. He gets closer and opens the door and he's now dressed as a Hidden One's recruit, showing his growing, getting more in control of his mind, but he's now in front of a chasm. That's where the genie lies, deep within Basim's mind and consciousness, but again he's finally ready to face it. He performs the leap of faith and finally finds it, and finally, at this point, Basim is able to overcome the genie, to own the trauma. At this point, knowing what really happened, Basim is able to overcome the fear and pain from that memory in Loki's life. As he walks towards the genie, his outfit changes from the recruit outfit to the initiate one, while the genie gets smaller and smaller, symbolizing how Basim is getting in control of what is happening inside his head his breath steadies, and there he finally decides that that memory that the genie represents, it is going to stay in the past and it won't affect him anymore, finally causing the genie to disappear and when he's finally done, he is dressed with the master assassin outfit, he has grown to the point of getting in control of the struggle. But it's not over. After getting in control of the trauma from his ancient memory and from Loki's jailer, after liberating himself from what had haunted him, there's a tiny other matter about the essence of Loki's memories and personality within him. And it calls to him. Nihal says it is time for Basim to get a deeper understanding of the world left behind by them and their place within it. Which can be interpreted both for Basim to finally have a deeper understanding of the world he left behind, the Hidden Ones, the Order of the Ancients, etc., but also for Basim to understand the world left behind by the ones who came before and to get a better understanding of Loki's place within it. 
Here Basim realizes that the other struggle he has had all his life, his relationship or friendship but also of need in contrast with Nihal, this was the struggle he had with the memories and personality of Loki within him. The side of him that he resisted, as he calls it, and a reflection of who Loki once was. And the whole of this sequence has Basim and Nihal making the same mirror movements and gestures to represent that Basim and Loki's memories are two sides of the same coin. But while Basim says that Nihal is a reflection of who they once were, she makes the final proposal, the final temptation if you will, that is for Basim to become once more who he once was, to go back to have the knowledge and the deeper understanding of the world that Loki had. And she also proposes this by paraphrasing one of Basim's more famous lines in Valhalla. A new world awaits, and indeed a new world awaits for Basim should he choose Nihal, should he choose to not resist but to accept Loki's memories. And after all that, Basim is almost ready to accept them, but he still has some hesitation about Nihal specifically, his imaginary friend, the friend that has been there for him and with him for as long as he remembers. He knows that accepting Loki's memories will have her disappear, and thus he asks her if he's going to be alone when that happens in a very good performance by voice actor Limash Doob. This actually harkens back to something we already mentioned in the first episode of this analysis, that is a theme of loneliness and Basim's worry about ending up alone, of losing Nihal and thus needing her at times that is presented a few times in the game. The topic is already fascinating to me in itself, but it's even more interesting considering how Basim's dialogues and worries here were intentionally designed to bridge Mirage with Valhalla and describe some of the character's growth. In fact, in Valhalla we find a different Basim, one that says that he's always at peace and especially never alone. Of course, years after the process of accepting Loki's memories and personality that we are about to see. Here instead, he is still very worried that accepting Loki's memories will make him feel alone. But Nihal calms Basim's worries, she says he will never be alone, that she'll always be with him, and so Basim finally accepts her. He accepts Loki's memories, knowledge and essence to be part of him, to be him fully. And so it finally happens, human Basim and Nihal are no more, and out of that comes the first outing of the Basim we know from Assassin's Creed Valhalla, who is letting the memories of Loki run free, who very much identifies identifies as Loki and believes to be him. So much so that when he wakes up he even says, how long has it been? That's possibly the most ominous and revealing sentence of this scene which allows all of us to know what is happening here. So finally, eventually, Basim has accepted the memories of the Isu Loki. Like he said in the last chapter update of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it was an intense struggle, the one with the genie but also the one with Nihal but a brief one and especially it indeed ended with a mutual understanding between Basim and Nihal which created a new Basim altogether. And so this new Basim emerges from the Alamut temple a new man, a new being, which is supported by the way more electronic and ominous music that accompanies him. The surviving hidden ones, obviously not knowing what has happened, are happy and welcoming towards him. They cheer him up, it's like never actually happened, but finally he reaches mentor Rayhan, and this brings to an initially tense moment, I imagine here Rayhan might be questioning his own choice for a moment, but the two eventually exchange nods, which is everything Rayhan needs to know for now, with the two seeming to continue in good terms, meaning that Rayhan seems to be rather calm and collected about what he allowed to happen happen, but the same cannot be said of Roshan, who instead is seen heavily discussing with Rayhan, surely about his choice of allowing Basim to enter the vault and come out ever so different. With the most unexpected use of it is done in Assassin's Creed, Roshan makes a different choice, she decides to drop her hidden blade and to leave the hidden ones. She wants no more of this, this is so against her very fierce, loyal and dogmatic view of the creed. At this point she doesn't only feel betrayed by Basim, but also by Rayhan, by the brotherhood, and so she throws her hidden blade next to the campfire, meaning she decides to finally part ways with the brotherhood 
childhood and I think that the ending of Mirage, which is made of several dualities with Basim and Loki, potentially Odin and Loki, Basim and the Genie, Basim and Nihal, here presents another one that very much piqued my interest. On one side we have a loyal but dogmatic vision of the creed of following the precepts as if they were set in stone with no leeway, of protecting the first civilization secrets and artifacts only to not have them fall into the wrong hands with no intent on dabbling with them, a more protective and defensive approach if you will, which we have seen very frequently in the Assassin's Creed games as we mentioned in our previous video, but on the other hand we have Rehan who represents a freer approach to the creed which allows for interpretations, a more risk in taking one for sure which also includes dabbling with and using the first civilization tech to get some kind of advantage in the everlasting fight with the Order of the Ancients, but at the cost of more danger for the Brotherhood itself and also for several innocent people. And I'm happy to see that here it is this approach that prevails for once. Rayhan chooses to enhance Basim, so to speak, to have a better weapon against the Order at the cost of whatever this might bring. In a way, it is Rayhan that allowed for the modern day world to be endangered by a third world scale catastrophe, but at least we got the Basin we know and love, so I think that's a fair exchange. But back to Roshan, this gesture of throwing the blade and leaving the Brotherhood is important because it ties directly to her quest in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. In fact, in that quest that took place roughly 20 years after the events in Mirage, Roshan already had her hidden blade with her once again, quote unquote reclaimed after a long absence, meaning that she had found it in her to go back to the Brotherhood and the Hidden Ones with her saying that the years without it had been the hardest that she had ever known. Funnily enough, Roshan ended that mission too by saying it is done, in what is now another parallel through time. But here in Mirage we are so many years prior to that, and after Roshan leaves, Rayhan calls Basim to him, they are finally going to discuss where to go from there, with Basim already being slightly ironic about Rayhan, calling him mentor with inverted commas. Here already he knows he's something more, on another level compared to him and I'm pretty sure he's already thinking three steps ahead for his own plans, all the while seeing how he can support but also use the hidden ones for his own goals. But we're still not quite done yet, we still have a final part to the epilogue that starts with Enkidu flying in front of the Alamut fortress much as he did during Basim's first steps in Alamut. It's another parallel through time but with a very different outcome. Our ego sees Basim, it flies in front of him but only to scratch him in the face. The message here is pretty obvious, Enkido recognizes that that isn't the Basim he got to know in Alamo during training and that he spent time with in Baghdad. It is someone else, possibly someone worse, and so he scratches him and leaves him for good, which explains why Basim doesn't have an eagle of his own in Assassin's Creed Valhalla and also quite intentionally explains one of the scars or wrinkles that Basim has on his face in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. When this happens, Basim seems to reflect on this, he seems to consider it a fair reaction by Enkidu, but he might also be pondering that now he really has nobody else with him other than the Brotherhood that he is going to use for his own purposes. But again, this is the time for thinking. He mentions Loki's memory of being in prison here, how he festered in his dreams and scared him, but he has confronted his past or Loki's past and embraced it, as in embraced and accepted who he once was. He recognizes that he quote unquote shed his own skin in another place, another time, as in in Asgard during the Isu era as the Toba catastrophe was approaching, he uploaded his DNA into the seventh method machine, made a copy of his memories and personality that would travel through time, re-emerge in a human and only now, after so many centuries, he says he is whole again. He remembers everything of Loki's life, of Loki's past and thus, should any of those who tried to bind him still walk the earth, he will definitely hunt them down. This is the main connection between the ending of Mirage and the beginning of Valhalla and it's interesting in its own way. By having now the full extent of Loki's memories, Basim knows that if everything went according to plan, 
eight more reborn Isu might be walking the earth right now, and their Isu counterparts oftentimes scorn Loki during the Isu era. So of course he will be looking for the reincarnation of Odin, his blood brother turned into worst enemy, and possibly his own jailer. But if you pay attention, he says, as for those who thought to bind me. So this maybe extends to the other reborn Isu as well, whom he would gladly hunt down if only to find a lead that will get him to find the reincarnation of his target and exact his revenge. And that is exactly what will happen a few years after the events in Mirage, where Basim, then turned into the leader of the Constantinople Bureau, will hear the first faint information about Sigurd, which is going to get him very interested in their reunion and which will set the way for all the events in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Basim's clash with Odin's reincarnation Eivor in Norway and his new plan that led him to be revived in the modern day, effectively getting the final upper hand on the Isu Odin. But that of course is the future. For now, Basim is still about to start his search. For now, once again, a new world awaits. And that was it for the second part of our story analysis of Assassin's Creed Mirage and also for the second and final part of the analysis of the ending of the game. Join us in part 3 of our analysis where, as planned, we are going to go back to the intro of the game and start of Basim's story and analyze it with the ending of the game in mind, trying to delve into all the details you might have missed in your first playthrough, and guess what, we might also have an update on the Isu language sentences pronounced in there. Thanks for watching, a huge thanks to our ATA insiders and their amazing support for our work, you guys are really true legends. And I'll see you all in our next video.